Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meanahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take a look at Guns and Steel from MOA Ideas Game Design. Now, if you're a fan of my channel, you probably know that I'm a fan of MOA Ideas Game Design. They make small games. I don't think any game they've made is, goes into a box bigger than that. But they're small games with really cool themes and with the pack a lot of punch for having a small amount of cards and components. And Guns and Steel is no different. The theme this time is civilization building. But this, we're not talking about Sid Meier's civilization here. It is a card game first and foremost. But one of my favorite things in games is to use a card for multiple different things. And that's what happens in Guns and Steel. You're using cards both as resources, but also as technologies, which give you special abilities. And you're working your way through a pyramid of history. Let's go ahead and take a brief look at how the game is played. Then we're going to come back. I'll let you know what I think. All right, let me run you through Guns and Steel. This is a competitive game. The goal is to have the most points at the end of the game. The end of the game is gonna be triggered whenever either all the wonders have been purchased or all three cards at the top of the pyramid representing the space age have been purchased. Now, this is a typical setup for the game. Every row rec uh, represents a different age of mankind and you're working your way from the bottom all the way to the top. You're gonna shuffle up all of the development cards, which is what these are called, and then you're gonna put the wonder cards off to the side of each age and their appropriate age. Now, each of the wonder cards is actually double-sided and you have to um, look at the random allotment of development cards in each age to determine which side that you use. Up in the top corner, it will have an icon corresponding to one of the cards, like on the hanging garden side, it has a picture of the caravan and on the pyramid side, it has a picture of um, the domestication card. Whichever card is closest to the uh, left side of the pyramid where the wonders will go, that determines which side of the card you use. So since domestication is closest, you're going to have pyramids there. There's not a, they're just different on each side, but um, it, it's not a huge gulf of difference. It's just adding a little bit of variability to the game. Before I get into the nitty gritty of what all the cards do and different interactions and abilities and things like that, let me just run you through the basic gameplay and what you're going to do on your turn. Each player is going to start off with a set of these resource slash development cards. The first thing you have to do on your turn is play one of the cards face down as a resource. This is mandatory. When you play a card on this side, which is the face down size, it represents a resource. You ignore what's on the other side of the card for now. So I've played this down, now I have one food resource. During the course of the game, if at any point I have to be called on to use um, this resource, whether it's depleted from an attack or I just use it to deplete it to purchase a development card, I'm gonna flip it over to this side. I do not activate the ability on this side when I flip it over, it's just showing that I have depleted it from its food side to its non-food side. So the first thing you do on your turn is play a card down as a resource. The second thing that you must do is play another card from your hand face up for its development action. Now you may or may not actually use that action, but you must play a card face up and then you have the option of doing so. The next thing you can do is optionally purchase a card. You're either gonna purchase one of the development cards from the main pyramid, or you're gonna purchase one of the wonders cards. Now, when you purchase one of the development cards, you have to expend resources all the time. So let's say that I wanted to buy the caravan here. The caravan, I'll focus in a bit. Uh, the caravan requires that I expend one food resource. So I can actually go ahead and get that right now with this example. So in order to do that, I'm gonna deplete this card. I'm gonna take the caravan and I'm gonna put it in front of me. I'm gonna put it into my tableau here. Now you are not necessarily required to start from the bottom and work your way up to get these development cards, but it is much, much more difficult to do so with uh, higher up cards in the pyramid. Not only because they require different types of resources that you may not have access to yet, but also for every card that is below a card that you want to purchase higher up in the pyramid, you have to expend an additional resource. It can be any resource it, um, after you spend the ones that you have to spend. So instance, for charge here, I need to spend a food 
food in a horse. Once I've expended those, um, I'd also have to spend any other resource in, because the swordsman card is attached below it. Whereas if I wanted this guild's card, it would be even more expensive because there are two cards attached to it technically. My pyramid's not very pretty, but the guild's card has two cards attached to it. So that's an additional two resources on top of that. And gaps don't fill in or anything. If I actually purchase a guild card, it would just stay out there like that. Now, if I want to take one of the wonders, it's the same thing, except that sometimes it requires that I spend resources, like in the case of the giant mosque of Jan, which requires two horses and an oil. But a lot of times it's just meeting a certain prerequisite. So the pyramids here says that as soon as someone has seven cards in front of them, they can use their purchase action to just take the pyramid card. And the wonders just count for victory points. Now, all of the cards above the first row in the development pyramid actually count for victory points as well. This little scroll represents uh, victory points. However, the wonders uh, usually are worth much, are always worth much more than the other cards in their row. So the pyramids themselves, uh, even, the, even though it's the bottom row, is going to be worth three victory points. And you're just going to put this in front of you. You'll never do anything with it. It doesn't count as resources or give you an action or anything like that. However, it can be taken away from you because of attacks. So it may not be permanently in front of you. The last thing you do on your turn is sort of end of turn cleanup, which can mean a couple of different things. If you still if uh, you still have more than one card left in your hand, nothing happens. It just goes to the next player in turn order and clockwise order. However, if you only have zero or one card left in your hand, you scoop up all of your face-up development cards that you have in play, and then you optionally can either scoop up your resource cards or leave them down in play. So if I had zero or one card left in hand and I have a bunch of development cards, I could take them all back in the hand and I can leave out my one bread if I really want to, or I can take that up as well. But the point is you do not reset your hand until you get down to zero or one, and then play continues to the next person. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the actual card abilities and some other um, important footnotes. First off, if anytime you need to get a resource, but you don't have a particular resource available to you from the cards in play, there is a handy dandy way to convert resources to something else. And this little uh, cheat sheet card will tell you how. So for instance, you can convert two bread into one iron, two horses into a gunpowder, Three of any resource, which is what the little vase symbol represents, can turn into a wild, which is what the earth represents. And as you go through the pyramid, you're going to get these different types of resources, by the way. Let me just uh, replace the card I got from the pyramid. There you go. So, for instance, um, down here, and by the way, the front of each of the cards up in the top left corner will remind you of what resource is on the other side. So on the bottom row, you can get horses. Um, on the uh, next row of the gunpowder age, you get gunpowder, surprisingly enough. Remember that these are worth victory points as well at the end. Um, the next row up is the oil age, so you're going to be able to gain the oil resource from that. Then you have Earth, and Earth is a wild. You can use an, uh, Earth for any one resource of your choice. And the final row, the Space Age, you uh, can use the space resource as essentially two wilds, which is two of anything of your choice. And it doesn't have to be the same thing. It could be two different things as well. The cards are generally broken up into three different types. You have the civil cards, which are production. They're going to keep your resource engine going. So, for instance, the caravan I used in my previous example. Um, if you play this for its action during the development phase of your turn, you can deplete a resource card in order to gain an earth. So you make one resource into a wild. Whereas a card like the Ironworks just gives you either two iron or a horse when you play it. There's other cards that let you flip back up other resource cards like the Domestication card. says that you can flip a food in a horse card to their resource card. So if I previously had a card that was flipped over to its um, uh, action side because I had used it already, like I had depleted it, I'd be able to flip it back over to its resource side. So there's that. Then you're going to have the attack cards. The attack cards are obviously all of the red cards. And when you play one of the attack cards, you're attacking all of your other opponents when you decide to use it for its development action. Now, every attack card has, and also the uh, tactics cards, which we'll get to in a moment, have these little crossed weapon symbols. So when you make an attack, you're going to count up every weapon symbol you have in your tableau, not just on the attack card that you just played, but on the other cards as well, which I think are always going to be the uh, tactics cards. And if your number of those sword symbols exceeds the other player's attack symbols that they have in front of them, your attack is successful. The swordsman card actually is a nasty one because you get to steal one of their wonder cards. Well, in this case, it says... Um, 
the defeated player is choosing to give you one of their wonders of their choice. Uh, some of the other ones, make like the knight card here, makes other players deplete their resources that they have in front of them. Um, so that can be a very nasty thing, assuming that the other players um, can't mount a, uh, a good defense. Now, actually, on the knight card, there's an example of the reaction symbol. The reaction symbol is little arrows that tell you that you can play this card out of turn order. So in this case, you can react to someone else attacking you by throwing down a knight card. You don't get to do the knight's attack, but you do get to add a sword to your total, which may be enough to fend off an attack. Um, the ambush, or the, I'm sorry, the, this is the ambush card, but these are tactics cards. And tactics cards, uh, you can play them the same as other development cards if you want. And for example, the ambush card says that you can flip open an attack card and activate its effect. Um, so in other words, if a card that is an attack card had been previously used as a resource, you, uh, you can flip that one over and then immediately resolve its attack action. But alternatively, just like with the knight card I showed you, you can play this as a reaction to get a sword symbol and possibly fend off an attack. Um, there's also the one of the basic cards that you start off with, which is the uh, reinforcements card, lets you do something similar. You can play an attack or tactic card from your hand. And that attack will not be activated. So this is not actually attacking the other players, but you play this card just to get another attack card out of your hand. And by the way, a lot of times you just want to play cards from your hand as quickly as possible, even if they don't do much for you, just so that you can reset your hand because you don't reset your hand until you're about to run out of everything. And of course, as you go through the different ages, cards get better and better. So uh, if you get up to the top, you have the stock exchange card, which just gives you a space. Uh, which uh, will let you, which again is two wilds. Um, the uh, tactics and the combat cards get better. The satellite card lets you pay, play three attack cards from your hand and then choose one to activate. Again, you're just getting rid of cards as quickly as you can from your hand. Um, cards like the uh, fighter and the nuclear submarine do the same thing as previous attack cards like depleting resources, but they give you way more sword symbols, uh, cross weapon symbols, which can be very, very important. And that's really the game. I mean, you're just basically uh, playing cards down as resources, using those resources, uh, and then playing cards down to activate their ability, then using the resources that you've gathered in order to buy more cards and work your way up the pyramid, possibly attacking the other players, possibly gaining wonder cards as well, just for the points that they offer to you, and so on and so forth. As soon as someone gets all the wonders, or as soon as you've worked your way through the entire pyramid and everyone buys all the stuff at, up at the top, the game ends. Whoever has the most victory points represented by these uh, scroll symbols is going to win the game. That is Guns and Steel. Now, let's get to my final thoughts. Visually, the game looks pretty cool. I mean, it looks pretty generic to a point. Uh, that's just They were going for sort of a bare bones aesthetic to it, but I also think it looks pretty slick at the same time. I would not be surprised if this was going to get a makeover at some point in the future, but even as it is right now, I think it looks pretty cool. Now, the theme of the game is the civilization building. That comes across to a degree. You are definitely building up to something. You are definitely like working your way towards it, gathering things, getting stronger as you work your way through the pyramid. And that does feel like you're sort of struggling through to make a civilization. But still, the game is only just a bunch of cards and at times you, no one's even really paying attention to what the name of the card is or what it represents, whether it represents agriculture or irrigation or a flight bomber. No one is really looking at that or looking at the symbols. So I think that the theme suffers a little bit for that. You can definitely say it's pasted on to a degree. But again, the, the main core of what a civilization game should be, which is building up and making yourself stronger over time and getting more and more and more expanding yourself, does carry through. So that was at least pretty cool in that regard. Now, as for the gameplay, again, I love it when you can use a card for multiple things. And I know that other games have done the same thing that Guns and Steel does here with using your card as both a resource and as a potentially an action, but I gotta tell you, it just feels so cool in this game. It felt innovative to me at the time. And even if other games have done it, I don't know that they've done it in with as much style as Guns and Steel does because you, it, it's 
really kind of a puzzly thing. This is a very deterministic game. There's no randomness here. The only randomness is I don't know exactly what you have in your hand because I wasn't paying attention. But if you do pay attention, then you know exactly what's going on out at the table at all times. And you can account for that at all times. So when that is the case, when you cannot rely on die rolls to change things up at all, it comes down purely to what your strategy is going to be. And in this case, that strategy revolves around whether or not you're going to use a card for its action or for its resource, knowing though that that can change on a dime. It could be that you play a card as a resource, you flip it over to its action side, something else lets you flip it back over to its resource side, then you're going to scoop all the cards anyways once you've played all of them, and now you have access to all that again. But maybe you want to make sure as many resources as possible stay down there for when you scoop your cards, when you run out of cards or get down to one. Uh, in order to set yourself up because if you blow your entire wallet all at the same time then you're stuck in a situation where you are not going to be able to do much until you can put enough cards out there so there's an interesting dynamic to the game where you're trying to flush your hand as quickly as possible to get as many cards as you want down on the table to get as many of them back as quickly as possible but at the same time, you want to be making the most use of all of those cards in the most efficient way possible, working your way through the Civilization Pyramid. And that is a lot of fun, by the way, because you could skip ahead in the pyramid, but it's going to cost you, and it's going to cost you big. And you still need to have a baseline to start with. You need to have a, an engine going. This is an engine building game in a way because it's not only just flipping cards over for their singular resource, but some cards in their actions will let you flip over other cards and it will let you uh, just play the card and get certain resources or convert resources from one to another. You need to have this system going so you can build up to the bigger and better cards, which is where the action is, not just point wise, but in letting you get more special abilities and more resources Especially when you get up to like the wild resource, and then the uh, it's was it the uh, yeah it starts off at the 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 earth resource, which is just a single wild, and the space resource, which is like two wild, and getting up to that point, even though that's near the end of the game, is super super critical. Then you have the wonders, and the wonders are an interesting beast because really you can win the game without focusing too much on them. Now that's really only going to happen if multiple people are going for wonders. If one person. Uh, just gets monopolizes the wonders, they're probably gonna win. But if multiple people are grabbing them, but you are going for a lot of different techs and resources, you're probably gonna do better because every card is, except for the bottom row, is worth something and worth an escalating amount of points as well. So who cares if they just got that one wonder, you got three cards in that row, which either equaled those points or exceeded it, depending on where it is. So I really enjoy that aspect of the game as well. The wonders are something you can definitely strive towards. It gives you direction, but it's not the end all be all. If I had to come up with a problem for the game, the one issue I have is how attacking, not how it works, but the fact that it is such an amazingly powerful thing in this game. I dislike it when a game has one strategy or one resource or one thing that is way powerful, way more powerful than the other aspects of the game and causes people to have to take that into account and therefore, oh, that person is getting a lot of attack. Well, now I have to modify my strategy just to keep him in check. I kind of find that frustrating. This is the kind of game where I wish people could just do their own thing, do their own strategy. But if someone is attacking you turn after turn after turn, which if you're going the attack route, if you get a bunch of those attack cards under your belt, you are going to want to do, then that is very frustrating. They can screw you out of a bunch of your resources or take your wonders away. And you're like, well, now I'm just falling further behind. So that's a bit of a frustration. I wish it was either the less, uh, restrictive or you took less penalties for being attacked or that it was easier to fend off an attack or that there was more attack cards so that more people could do it and have a better chance at having a viable defense out there on the table. Um, so even though I like the way that it works, it is crippling at times if you're on the receiving end of it. Even so, I like this game a lot. This is continuing the tradition of Mo Ideas games that pack a lot of punch in a small box. I want to see more. I want to see more expansions. I want to see more types of tech. I want to see, you know, and that's the thing. Expansions could take care of that attacking problem. And that's why I'm being less, um, uh, less, you know, 
I'm not being as critical of that as I probably should be because I think it's an easy fix because the game itself is really, really solid and fun and looks great and even has a bit of that Civ theme going on, which I really enjoy. That is Guns and Steel from MOA Ideas Game Design. If you can find it, get it. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.